I want to start because much of science today is team science, and we would not be able to accomplish what we can accomplish without our collaborators. But I want to in particular thank my very close colleague, Dr. Joan Luby, who's a child psychiatrist and has worked with me on all the projects that I'm going to present to you today, as well as a host of just brilliant young investigators, postdocs, and graduate students who've also contributed to this work. I also think it's important as scientists to point out that I don't have any conflicts of interest towards the work that I'm going to be presenting today. Now, I think all of you know that the causes of mental illness are multifactorial. There are many different things that can increase risk for brain health challenges and mental illness later in life. These include genetics, a host of what I'll call individual factors, idiosyncratic things that occur to people that increase their risk for brain health challenges later in life. But we also know that there are a host of systematic environmental factors that can also increase risk for brain health challenges across the lifespan. These include things like abuse and trauma and stressful life events that people can experience both in childhood and throughout the course of their life. It can include discrimination and structural adversity in various societies. In particular today, I'm going to focus on, though, childhood poverty and what I'm going to call neighborhood adversity. And by neighborhood adversity, I mean factors in addition to those experienced in a child's individual household that have to do with kind of the stressors that they may encounter in their environment, the sort of overall income level of a neighborhood, safety concerns, crime rates, other things that may increase stress for children. So again, in particular, I'm going to focus today on childhood poverty and neighborhood adversity. There is robust evidence that both of these factors are associated with increased risk for brain health challenges across the lifespan. And what I'm going to talk about today are some of the pathways and mechanisms that might link early childhood poverty to later risk for mental illness. And I think that's going to be important for two reasons. So one reason is to understand how and why early poverty leads to this increased risk, but also because I think this pathway may illustrate an understanding of some of the mechanisms that may contribute to brain development and risk for mental illness, whether or not it's associated with poverty. And so it may give us some additional clues for targets for intervention, particularly early intervention that might help head off some of this risk. So in particular, we know that early childhood poverty is associated with increased chronic stress, associated with having fewer resources, less access to health care, poor nutrition, living in food de deserts, having housing instability. We also know that early poverty is associated with disruptions to caretaker relationships with children, right? I think all of us can resonate with the fact that when we are stressed as parents, it makes it difficult for us to be our best parent. And if you are living in poverty, trying to hold down multiple jobs in order to make ends meet, it can really make it challenging. Sadly, we also know that childhood poverty is associated with increased exposure to a range of environmental toxins. Uh, lower income neighbor neighborhoods often tend to be closer to highways, greater exposure to air pollution, um, greater exposure to things like lead and other environmental toxins. And we know that all of these things can have an impact on brain development across childhood. And we think that it is this impact on brain development that is contributing to the increased risk for brain health and mental illness later in life. So I'm going to try to unpack some of these pathways for you today. And I'm going to start by focusing on, you know, in kind of early poverty, environmental enrichment, and nurturance or caretaking nurturance. And this is a good place to start because we actually have really important animal models of some of these processes that are allowing us to ask mechanistic questions about how it is that these early environmental experiences get inside the skin and into the brain. And what we know from this rodent research is that early environmental enrichment and maternal nurturance impacts gene expression in the brain, and that in turn impacts the growth of neurons in the brain, right? The elements of our brain that help do the computations that let us think and behave and have emotions, have thoughts and memories. And in particular, there's good evidence that these factors influence the, the structure and function of a region of the brain called the hippocampus, 
which is very important for our ability to regulate our response to stress and to regulate our emotional responses. And what we know from this rodent work that allows us to actually establish causality is that rat pups who experience early environmental enrichment, early high maternal nurturance, and in a rodent model that is in the form of licking and grooming, are better able to modulate their stress later in life and have larger hippocampi um, and better structure and function of the hippocampus. In turn, when we think about sort of intergenerational transmission of things, those pups that received high nurturance from their own parents early in life and have better development of the structure and function of the hippocampus, in turn, are able to give more nurturance to their own pups later in life. So these rodent models are really important and intriguing, but we want to know what's happening in humans, right? Are similar processes operating in humans? And that's been a challenging question to answer because it really requires very long-term longitudinal data. And I've been fortunate to work with my colleague Joan Luby on a 17-year study of children where we recruited children early on in life um, when they were in preschool. And we have been working with these kids and their families for 17 years now, and they just entered early adulthood. Early in life, they were recruited in part because some of them had early signs and symptoms of depression. And every year, the kids and their families would come and talk to us about what's going on in their lives, tell us about their own mental health, their children's mental health, their experiences, their life events, a host of other factors. And when they were a little bit older in school age, we started doing brain imaging. And we did that using what's called an MRI machine. Many of you probably have been in one if you've broken an arm or a leg. And we can use our MRI machine to assess both the structure and the function of the brain. And I'm going to focus in part on the hippocampus today. So we were able to look at um, early preschool poverty. So we had measures of family income from early on. We also actually had measures of observed caretaker support. So we actually had videotaped interactions of children and their families. And we were able to code those videotaped interactions for various indices of supportive parenting. We also were prospectively getting reports about life events that children were experiencing over time. And then at their first MRI scan when they were you know, about eight or nine years old, we were able to measure the volume of the hippocampus. And as we have seen in the animal models, we saw that greater preschool poverty, right, so lower family income early in childhood, was associated with reduced volume of the hippocampus. And the location of the hippocampus is illustrated here by these structures in purple. Um, so just like the rodent models, lower environmental enrichment, early preschool poverty associated with reduced volume of the hippocampus. Critically, we also saw that early childhood poverty, not surprisingly, right, was associated with children experiencing greater life, um, stressful life events. And it was also associated with disruptions to supportive parenting. Critically then, we also saw that both life events and parenting were in turn related to reduced hippocampal volume. And in fact, our statistical analyses told us that that relationship of early poverty to life events and parenting to hippocampal brain volume accounted for part of that relationship between early childhood poverty and brain volume. Very consistent with the animal models that have been able to look at the same thing. Now, it's important to look at the volume of the hippocampus in humans. It, it gives us some important indicators, but we do it because we think it's telling us something about the likely function or connectivity of the hippocampus, right? So the hippocampus doesn't do things in isolation. It does things by communicating and interacting with other parts of the brain that are also important for our ability to regulate stress and our emotions. So we call that functional brain connectivity. And we can also measure functional brain connectivity in humans using that same MRI scanner. So I could have you come lay quietly at rest in the scanner, and I can measure spontaneous fluctuations in brain activity over time. And I can look at areas of the brain that show similar versus different patterns of those spontaneous fluctuations over time. Regions that show similar patterns over time, we would say that they show positive functional connectivity. And regions that show the opposite patterns, we might say show negative functional connectivity. In terms of what we know about the connectivity of the hippocampus, 
We know that the hippocampus shows positive functional connectivity or similar patterns of spontaneous brain wave fluctuations with other regions of the brain also thought to be important for experiencing stress or emotions. Regions like the amygdala and parts of the cingulate cortex. But critically, we actually see opposite patterns of spontaneous fluctuations in brain activity between the hippocampus and parts of the brain that we know are critically important for regulating our thoughts and actions and behavior. Those parts of the brain, like the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, the dorsal anterior cingulate, the dorsal parietal cortex. They almost show what you might call a push-pull relationship. When activity is up in one set of regions, like the regions important for controlling our behavior, activity is decreased in regions like the hippocampus and the amygdala, suggesting that maybe that's uh, the way in which we enact behavioral regulation or emotion regulation or control of our stress. So you can imagine if there are disruptions between the communication of the hippocampus to these other brain regions, that might lead to challenges in being able to regulate your emotion, emotions or stress responsivity. So we wanted to look at that also in relationship to early childhood poverty and in relationship to the later experience of mental health challenges such as depression. And so what we see, you know, replicating a number of other studies is that early childhood poverty is associated with a greater risk for depression starting as early as school age. And importantly, that's even when we control for the depression that they were, some of the kids were already experiencing early in preschool, suggesting it's actually associated with an increase in depression over time. But also we see that early childhood poverty is associated with a disruption in the connectivity between the hippocampus and the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. A disruption in that connectivity that we think is really important for people, children, being able to learn to regulate their stress responses and their emotions. And we also see then that that pattern of disrupted connectivity is associated with school-age depression. And again, our statistical analyses tell us that this pathway from early poverty through disruptions in functional brain connectivity to school-age depression seems to account for part of that relationship between early poverty and later depression. Again, suggesting that the impact of early poverty on the development of the hippocampus and its connectivity with other brain regions critical for emotion regulation may be contributing to risk for depression. Now, I, I've talked about depression and anxiety. Um, you might be thinking, well, is it just depression and anxiety, or is this also contributing to risk for other forms of brain health challenges? And in particular, I want to talk a little bit about risk for psychosis, because I think we know that there's clear evidence for genetic and a variety of neurobiological contributions to psychosis. But we are now increasingly understanding that there are social determinants or environmental factors that also impact risk for the development of brain health challenges like psychosis. And to study that, I want to actually turn to data from a different project called the Adolescent Brain and Cognitive Development Study. Some of my colleagues who also work on this study are here in the audience. And this is a really unique um, study in the United States. It's the largest study ever of the development of the brain in children. We've recruited over 11,000 kids across the United States starting when they were ages 9 and 10, and we've now been following them, and we are going to be following them up until adulthood. And we do a variety of assessments with them, we do brain imaging with them, and we also look at factors associated not only with their family income and poverty, but other factors as well, like neighborhood. And indeed, what we see is that things like neighborhood deprivation, perceptions of safety and crime um, and exposure to lead are associated with an increased risk of psychotic-like symptoms, kind of the earliest potential precursors of psychosis or schizophrenia, and that that seems to be mediated in part by a relationship of those neighborhood factors to reductions in cortical gray matter volume. So gray matter contains the neurons that kind of do our computations, and we see reduced gray matter volume predicting psychotic-like experiences in these kids. Now you may say, well, how long do these relationships last, right? Our, our economic circumstances can change throughout the course of life. And you know, is it important, maybe if you're able to move out of poverty later in life, are there lasting impacts of early childhood poverty? And in short, the answer is yes. So turning back to that 17-year study where we followed children over time, when we look at adulthood at the relationship between early childhood poverty and outcomes, we see that those kids who grew up in poverty had worse cognitive function, 
ongoing challenges with depression, greater high-risk behavior, poor educational outcomes, and worse social relationships. And further, we are now able to look at the trajectory of brain development across childhood and adolescence, not just that first time point, but growth over time. And what you see here, and I'm going to focus here on the whole subcortex that includes the hippocampus as well as structures like the amygdala and the thalamus and the caudate, what you see here, age, and this is sort of a typical pattern where we see growth in the brain over development. That's what we expect. That's what we should see. But what we see, these are kids who grew up in the lowest, you know, income to needs or the most poverty. If you look at kind of increasing income levels, what you see is not only are they starting out with larger brain volumes, but there's a greater increase in those brain volumes over the course of development. And we also see that these differences in the trajectory of brain development are again in part mediating that relationship between early childhood poverty and these later negative outcomes. So what's the take home message here, right? Well, the take home message is that early poverty, like other forms of early adversity, gets under the skin and into the brain and increases risk for many forms of brain health challenges later in life. It's a public health crisis that we really do need to solve. Um, good evidence for causal effects. And I think it also really highlights the need for one thing that One Mind is really doing a wonderful job of, which is focusing on the need for early detection and intervention. These challenges are emerging early in life. We need to identify those kids most at risk with good tools that are effective at screening and identifying who is at risk, and then connecting them with care and making sure that they have effective interventions available to them. I also think that it gives us an opportunity to develop some interventions for those mediating factors and understanding even more about how poverty gets into the brain. There's evidence for a role of inflammation, sleep disruption, even the microbiome, which is the kind of bacterial composition of our gut. All of those things impact brain development normatively. And if there are disruptions in those things due to poverty or potentially due to other mechanisms, genetics, or other things, that may be part of the pathway leading to disruptions in brain development. And those may be actionable and, you know, kind of targeted things that we can actually develop interventions to enhance. So I'll stop there and say thank you.